Many times when we talk about our Christian faith or our belief in God, we think of our posture as one of looking up. But in today's episode of The Way of Wonder, we're going to be encouraged to look down. And by the way, it's not at our smartphones. Hello and welcome back, friends, to The Way of Wonder. We are privileged that you join us for this channel for these many episodes now, well over two dozen, and we're just having fun. And right off camera, before we started recording, the Easter joy is already bubbling up between Father Patrick and I. We're getting silly and goofy over here. It's the fruit of the resurrection. Father Pat, how are you? Welcome I'm back. I'm good, man. I'm still wiping the see, tears from my See, eyes. he's got a little... Yeah, Ooh. yeah, it's all sparkly because I'm crying over here. It's it's one of those things where yeah, it strikes you get struck by something funny and you're like, I don't know where that came from or why I'm laughing so much, but it's all good. Yep, and then it like builds and builds and builds. And you can't <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, level upon level. Oh, that's man. that's like when the apostles were accused of drinking too much wine, right yeah, after Pentecost. These guys be? Got I know drink. what's going on over there. Why are you so happy? Mm-hmm. Well, we we are happy because we are on the way of wonder. We are going in. In this fantastic Easter season, you made a great point a few episodes ago, Father Pat, that we fast for 40 days, we feast for 50, and that's a lot of alliteration right there. Fast for 40, feast for 50. Wow, say that five times fast. So there's more joy because of the resurrection, because of the power of Christ, and man, oh man, do we need this joy to overflow today in our world. Amen. There's a lot of crankiness out there, a lot of sadness, but we are bringing the fruit of the gospel, which is joy. Um, it just so happens that my uh, my works today that I want to share for this Way of Wonder episode, my, my images are the joys of my heart, and they are masterpieces by not Michelangelo or Giotto, but the Lord himself. I'm going to show you pictures of my kids. Pulling, up, pulling out the big guns. <laughs> big guns. Let's go right to the maker. I... This is my one of my favorite seasons. I love fall. I think fall is my hands down favorite season of the year in the rhythm of of, of the natural world. But spring is right. I just love spring too. Yeah. And so I was going through some old photos of the kids. And coincidentally, each of my kids now, they're 14, 12, 10, and 7. But the images I want to share today in the episode are my kids when they were all roughly three or four. And they were just kind of in the middle of I'm discovering the world. Oh, I yeah. taste I and see that the Lord is good. It is. It's exploration and celebration, and everything's good. So I'm going to reveal, well, Thomas will reveal, we've got four different pictures of the four kids. Oh, and let's great. just, we'll splash them up, and then I have an awesome quote from uh, Norman Whisper for you. So here we go. <laughs> hey, <Seth. laughs> so this is my Seth, my eldest, probably a over a decade ago when he was a wee lad and he could really sport that hat. Couldn't he? I mean, he's oh, wearing man. that yeah, well. He was, bucket hats before bucket hats were cool. <laughs> That's right. This is him strolling through uh, a friend of ours. This was a, my, a friend of my mother's actually in New Jersey had planted something like 3000 daffodils on their property. Oh. So yeah. I wish I had, I wish I had a panoramic shot of this. That's just cropped. This backyard was insane. And so Seth just had, literal field day wandering through so i just want to splash that there for a sec and then we'll here's sheila yeah and this is one of my favorite pics of my now 10 year old sheila grace uh standing in a field at malvern retreat center in pennsylvania and just inviting me to become a little hobbit like herself i love that little smile of those eyes i love that hair too Ooh, that hair is awesome Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. There's Claire. Drinking this from one. the hose? Yes, drinking from the hose. Now, if you're tuning in, uh, happy spring. Thanks for joining us. Happy Easter. And do you remember what it was like to drink from the garden hose, friends? I can taste it right now. Oh, that metallic sort of oh, yeah. minerally taste. And you didn't so care. You're thirsty. You're all sweaty. <laughs> like, oh, just give yeah. me the hose. Just get it. And you could drink a gallon. We probably literally did drink a gallon straight up. So yep. our babysitter at the time took this photograph of, uh, of our Claire, uh, Grace Galligan took this shot, and I just love it. I just love the abandon. Just Claire, she's just drinking from the waterfall, yep. and it's just all over the place. Right, and finally, we'll, we'll switch over to Kagan Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was, I'm like, what's the picture of Kagan? Here's our fourth and I funniest. 
He's the I little knew it. he's the little old man, Kagan Matthew. I mean, <laughs> he's always got something up his sleeve. I don't know what he was thinking about. He's surrounded by utter beauty and he's just like oh, he's he's got angry. a little mood. I don't know what <laughs> Or he's just pondering the fragility of it all, you know, the utter transience of the created world. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, that's probably what he's thinking. But what a great shot. So. Oh, that's so awesome. (laughs) These great pics. I love it. By the way, you know, as a dad, I I think I have 65,413 photographs of my kids. Ish. Ish. Give or take. Give or take a dozen. And uh, I just love it. I love to capture moments like this. And I try to do it subtly. I try not to be like, you know framing it all just oh there it is during the moment bam but you'll notice a theme father patrick that we've kind of got this garden motif going on and so this is what's been striking me as i wanted to prep for this episode the the resurrection and post-resurrection uh stories there's gardens there's gardens that play incredibly important roles and i was pondering this it all began in a garden right eden eden was a garden were cast out, sadly, of that garden into wilderness, Jesus comes into the world, and before his public ministry, he's in that wilderness. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this back and forth. Then he comes into the Garden of Gethsemane to reset, to restart everything. And on the morning of the resurrection, he appears in a garden. And in fact, he's mistaken by St. Mary Magdalene as the gardener which I think is the most hilarious line in the entire Bible. Like, here's the resurrected son of God. Are you the gardener? Are you the gardener? Are, are you trimming the verge out here, sir? <laughs> uh, but this idea of, of garden, then wilderness, then back to the garden, the reset, and back to a garden. And of course, the book of Revelation, in the end, talks about this. There's garden imagery all over the place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, or you look at how the temple is designed or constructed, all the ornamentation it's all covered in plants and flowers all of that's mm. carved into it all the design it's supposed to it's yeah. it was evocative of eden it was supposed to look like a little garden yeah so before actually before i read this quote then let's if we could open this up a little bit what's the difference between a garden and and wilderness mm. even poetically let's 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 tackle that for a second because i want to read a quote about gardening per se but i think salvation history is this dance between garden and wilderness what do those images kind of mean to you? Um, well, I, it, so if you're juxtaposing, like, so let's just be clear. So when we speak of wilderness, we're talking about, like, the space that, like, Jesus went into in the beginning of his public ministry, right? Right, right, with the beasts, right? so we're not you know, talking about, like, accompanying him. The, 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 we're not talking about, like, the wilderness of, you know, Pennsylvania. It's just beautiful <laughs> no. and lush. That's not what we're talking about by wilderness. We're talking about right. the difference between like a sort of barren, barren space mm-hmm. and a place of rich life. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a sense there of barrenness versus life. Yeah, that's that's the thing that was coming to me as well. There's there's something cultivated in a garden that is trying to sort of magnify the life or curate the life so that it's it's super exuberant, you know, and it's fruitful and you can, and here it is all laid out and uh, it kind of has boundaries, so to speak, you know, because obviously when, when they're, when Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, there's clearly a boundary there. There's a wall. And on the other side, thorns and thistles grew, right? So yeah, wildness is, wilderness is kind of this idea in in scripture of, um, I got to find water. I got to find my way back home or I'm going to die. Uh, so, so into this theme of garden then, and, and just sharing those pictures of my kids in these cultivated, beautiful gardens, I wanted to go into that because now post-resurrection, Jesus has brought us back to the garden, so to speak. Yeah. And so I'm going to quote, this is a, he's a professor at Duke University. His name's Norman Wurzba. And, uh, this is a great article called the ground of hospitality. We'll put a link down below. Um, and of course this quote by posting time, you'll be able to read along this quote. So here's Norman Wurzba meditating on this theme of garden. From an agrarian point of view, one of humanity's most important postures is looking down. Though plenty of spiritualities encourage people to look up and away to a better world beyond the blue, looking away causes us to forget that in fact the ground beneath our feet 
nurtures us. I'm going to pause there for a quick sec because like theology of the body. We always talk about embodiment, being rooted, being grounded. Wordsbook goes on, Scripture made the point inescapable to say the word human, Adam, Mm -hmm. Adam, is to be reminded of the ground, Adama, from which we come, by which we are fed, and to which upon death we return. So another pregnant pause there, Father Pat, because that's like, hmm. You know, another reminder, like, I know that, but man, that is a, that's an anchoring somehow that I, I think today in our, in our world where we're kind of like flipping all over the place and floating all over the place regarding identity, it's, it, we talked about this before, right? It's sort of the ghost, you know, it's this haunting the world, but I, I want to land somewhere. Saying Adam gonna, lands us. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, people feel so groundless or yeah unmoored detached ungrounded mm-hmm. um from their from the ability to answer the question who am i right you're just unmoored detached mm-hmm. groundless that's why uh, yeah i think that's part of the identity crisis that we're seeing in the world today the grasping at identities and tribal groups i think is is a direct result of losing a sense of our grounding. Where do we come from? Where, where yeah. is what? What's the original soil beneath our feet? Um, yeah, I think that's spot on, and that just the connection again in Hebrew, right? Adam and Adama. Mm-hmm. Like, that's so good. That's mm-hmm. so good. Dirt. Yeah, man. Well, well, dirt man, <laughs> man of dirt. Oh, he actually does unpack the difference between soil and dirt later, which is so good. I don't know that I have that quote here, but. Um, Stepping into that a little bit further, when we say wilderness, you know, or homelessness, I, you know, I'm not back rooted, grounded in my garden, the garden of the soil of my existence, just how terrifying that is, right? It's terrifying because I don't know how I'm going to survive. Uh, we have these shows that are, you know, very attractive to a lot of people watching these sort of, uh, you know, reality shows where people are thrown into the Alaskan wilderness with like a, a buck knife and that's all they've got. <laughs> we're we're drawn to it, but but it's the terror that haunts us. Like, are they going to make it home? Are they going to survive? Yeah. But so yeah, so Adam roots me right away. Adama, I am of the earth. I am of this is who I am. I find that so refreshing because it's it's a thing we can start to peel back right away and 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 be attentive to. Like right now, wherever anybody is listening to this episode. Where are you? Are you sitting? Are you standing? Um, are you outside on your back porch watching this episode? Take a deep breath. Look around. Experience the world through the locus of your senses and your body. Uh, Norman Wurzba's point here is like the, this. Like this is almost a life or death thing. <laughs> it's it's knowing who you are and where, and where you've come from or not. He, here's the next line in this first part of the quote. He says, to ignore the soil, or even worse, to despise it, is to cut oneself off from the love of God and the power of life that circulates through it. Mm. I mean, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Mm. To cut yourself off. Yeah, there is. It's um, Sometimes I think as Catholics, we can especially when I say you're like, I'm an Orthodox Catholic, sometimes we really, we kind of shy away from the environmental conversations and going green. Exactly <laughs> you you see where I'm going thinking. here? Yeah. And yeah. I think we, we should check ourselves because reading scripture and learning about our identity and where we've come from, it gives us the proper lens to, to view stewardship in the environment. Be careful, yeah. right? The, in Lewis's, C.S. Lewis's words, don't become more spiritual than God. Yeah. We're of the earth. Well, what? What I'm being reminded of right now is is the um, this past summer the trip that I I was so blessed to go on to Oxford, which mm. I know you and and uh, the students. Well, I think there's a pilgrimage probably coming up. Spring of 2024. Yeah. Spring of 2024. Mm-hmm. Um, back to Oxford. So it was a C.S. Lewis Tolkien pilgrimage. All of those things, and I think I've mentioned this before on this show, but the being overwhelmed by the ornate intricacy of design and 
architecture yeah. that everything there it was like mm. what was so evident was how the architects and the engineers they they were they were trying to copy god mm. right so like you look wow. at like there's lush gardens and just beauty everywhere in oxford like all of those colleges surround they're like built around these beautiful gardens you know like these beautiful mm. open quads with huge like modeling college the <laughs> addison's addison's walk like there is such gorgeous beauty that surrounds all of that. Um, <laughs> and you just peer at a single flower and you're like, oh my gosh, this is what those guys are trying to do on that ceiling in that building over there. Like they're just trying to copy God. Um, so the there is a deep connection between, yeah, between creation as a revelation of the creator, of course. And then like there's something very disturbingly demonic about... Um, a total disregard for creation. Mm. Like you're right that I think within those sorts of more orthodox conservative circles of the church, which I would put myself in that there, there tends to be a poo pooing of, you know, the sort of environmental concerns. That's, that's a thing of progressive ideology. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's all, I mean, like it, creation was the first gift from the creator to us. It's the, it's the first revelation. It's the first gift. And uh, I mean, we've talked ad nauseum on this show about how just s contemplating a single blade of grass, mm -hmm. if you give it time, will just throttle you up to the throne room. <laughs> um, and but we 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 want to pave paradise and put up a parking lot. <laughs> oh, there it is. There's the song. I knew that was going to work its way. In. <laughs> No, well said. <clears throat> I I need to get reoriented uh, constantly by this, and that's why I try to immerse myself from the first moments I wake up in the morning into the weather of the day, into the smell and feel of the day and of the world, and be mindful of the, spl the spot and the plot that we inhabit, the Donahue family and my four kids. And I, as much as I can, whenever we can, I try to get them out, get them out into yeah. these rhythms, get them out exploring uh, splashing through streams, flipping over rocks, figuring out what this flower is, what it smells like, you know, uh, it's, it's a restoration and a reorientation. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I can't wait for this Oxford trip, by the way, cause I still have holy jealousy that you went there and you, uh, mm, but I we're going, it out. I we scoped it out. Land. <laughs> you did some recon. Nice job. There are, there are giants there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're going, well, I can't wait. Well, yeah, what you just shared there too does it brings up a line from Tolkien who said, "We make in in the manner in which we are made, right? We are sub creators. The Creator makes us, and we long to create in the way He created." So, your point, Father Pat, we're making these plots of ground, we're ornamenting these fence posts and these lintels over doors, and it's organic and flowering because we're enamored by the Creator's love, and yeah. that's what we're doing too. We want to also create in that way. Uh, it's a kind of gardening through stone or stained glass or whatever. Mm. Okay, final thought from Norman Wordsby. I'm going to bring it home with a little, little something, something from his essay, The Ground of Hospitality. He says, and here's the lesson I feel like we could walk away with, just looking at the images of my kids I wanted to share and just this love of nature and the love of, of the garden. Here's what he says, and it's great advice. Gardening is one of the most vital practices for teaching people the art of creaturely life. With this art, people are asked to slow down and calibrate their desires to meet the needs and potential of the plants and animals under their care. So there's that, there's that stewardship God gifted us with in the beginning, right? Then he says, gardeners are invited to learn patience, to develop this sort of sympathy in which personal flourishing becomes tied to the flourishing of the many creatures that nurture them. A garden, we might say, is a living laboratory in which we have the chance to grow into nurturers, protectors, and celebrators of life. Mm. And he goes on, he talks about how this is like, this is, we do this alongside God the gardener and till and keep the garden of paradise. It's hard and frustrating work sometimes, he says, but it's not a punishment. To garden well is to participate in the way God gardens the world. 
All right. We will pop that quote um, in the show notes. I just think it's really rich and, you know, parabolic in the sense that as we look at look down, we're invited to look up. We see what God's doing in that first book of creation. Mm. Um, well, Father Pat, any final thoughts closing on that? You're going to go plant some uh, rhododendrons well, or anything after this about, episode? I've, I've had an orchid in my office that I have somehow managed to keep mostly alive for the last few months. <laughs> and literally, as we're recording this today, just a few hours ago, I, I gave it up for adoption. I gave it away, too. Wow. Because I'm like, I, I think I'm... I'm not a good steward of this beautiful flower. Someone else need to, needs to, to till and to keep it. I just okay. keep forgetting to, you have to put like a few ice cubes in it. Oh, into an orchid. So, okay. Yeah, that, you just put a few ice cubes you know, in it once a week. But I couldn't manage that. And half the orchid died. <laughs> All right, this episode is for you, Father Pat. It really is. I feel convicted. <laughs> yeah, this is an intervention. We want you to go to Lowe's yeah. or Home Depot and get something else. And just really ask should. them, like, what is the hardest plant that I could kill? Like, what is the toughest? And buy that. That's a really good idea. Maybe there's a cactus out there for you, Father Pat. Yeah, a a really hearty succulent. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Well, thank you, gang, for joining us for this episode of The Way of Wonder. And if you garden, let us know in the comments. What is your favorite stuff of the earth that you love to to till and keep? And drop some comments, too, that help Father Pat how to keep the orchid alive and other things. Just give him some advice. Send him some love. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share if this has been helpful and a gift for you. And we will see you next week for another episode where Father Pat will draw us deeper down the path of wonder and awe. God bless. Mm -hmm.